right scares to jump off the page or screen. Um, we are not entirely sure how to work the mic, so we're going to try and stand up here and shout. Can everybody hear me okay? Because I'm probably the, the softest voice. The other three are guys. They're good and loud. <laughs> so we are going to break today's uh, session into four different categories for you, and we're going to have a different instructor for each of these categories. We're going to look at setting, plot, characters, and mood. It's interesting that of these three, the first three, setting, plot, and characters, are things that apply to just about every form of fiction, but mood is something that's rarely discussed in, say, a love story or a mainstream drama, but it's very essential to horror. And it's one of the reasons that we decided to close with mood today. Um, we are all members of this organization, the Horror Writers Association. Thank you. My name is Lisa Morton. I'm the president of the HWA. We are an international nonprofit organization. We have about 1,500 members worldwide. We love new members. We love new writers. If you are interested in joining us, we have a table in the next room. Do not pay attention to your program book, which says 326. <laughs> uh, we are actually at 135. We're in the first aisle in the next room. We have membership uh, brochures, and we'd love to talk to you more about the organization. So please feel free to come on over, visit with us afterwards. We're here all weekend. OK, first off, um, we are going to go to setting. Uh, for setting, we have a gentleman named Taylor Grant who's going to talk about that. Taylor is a two-time Bram Stoker Award nominee. For those of you who don't know, the Stoker is the Oscar of the horror world. It's been given out for 30 years. It's uh, quite an honor to be a nominee for that. Taylor is, uh, also has done writing in screen and advertising. He's a very gifted writer. We're very happy to have him. And so without further ado, I will let Taylor take the stage and tell us about setting. Thank you, thank you. Okay, I have to kind of race through this because we're all on timers. <laughs> um, all right, so we're going to talk about setting uh, and how that will impact your horror film, your horror fiction, if you're creating a Halloween event, any of that. So first off, what is a setting? It's really the time and place and duration of your story. Uh, it's often told using imagery and descriptive details, obviously, and sensory language, you know, the, the words that appeal to your, the five senses. So let's talk about each of those three things real quickly. The time of the setting refers to an era or time of your story. So, for, in, for example, uh, if you've seen The Devil's Backbone by Guillermo del Toro, that's in, the, in 1939, the Spanish Civil War. If you've seen American Psycho or read the book, right, that's in the late 80s, time of uh, greed and uh, incredible narcissism and the yuppie movement, those settings had a very deep impact on the stories, the plots, how the characters see the world, all of those things. Um, but your time period could be anything from the far flung future to the past to the gold rush of the wild, wild west to the Great Depression. The place, of course, is a setting of where the, where the main action of the story takes place. Now you can have a story that takes place in multiple locations, like say Jaws or Psycho, but there's always usually one central location where the horror takes place, right? In Psycho it's the Bates Motel, in Jaws it's the boat, in Alien it's the spaceship, right? And then the duration of your story is simply how long it takes to get from the beginning to the end. So is it a day in the life, is it a 24 hour story, is it a week, a month, or potentially the lifetime of the character? Now, as I mentioned, the, the setting can have a very strong impact on your characters and your plot. Um, this goes all the way back to horror's predecessor, which is gothic fiction. If you think about those settings and those stories, they were often re remote settings, right? They were rambling mansions, they were crumbling convents and monasteries. Um, probably the most, the granddaddy of all of these was Dracula's castle, right? We're all probably familiar with that in some iteration, either through fiction or for film. Um, you know, it was, it, was, it was those multiple uh, variables of setting that really made it stand out. It was the mysteriousness of Transylvania. It was the big, oppressive, dark mysteriousness of the castle itself. And it was also the time period, right? It was the late 1890s. Uh, so how characters would react to those supernatural elements impacted the story versus contemporary people, how they would react to those supernatural elements. But the one thing, I, if any of you are taking notes, please write this down. Um, what they all play into 
is our fear of darkness and our fear of the unknown. That is something that is sort of uh, a common denominator in, in all these scary settings that we've seen, at least as far as I'm concerned. Um, they create an emotional response in us. They create an anticipation of dread. I'm talking about Gothic settings right now. Um, when you walk into a graveyard or you walk into an abandoned building, you're sort of setting up the viewer or the reader right, for that type of dread. You know something is not, something's probably not going to go well for the, for the protagonist. Now, even in, in, there are certainly current fiction and, <clears throat> and movies that still leverage Gothic traditions, like J.K. Rowling, right, in the Harry Potter series, Hogwarts Castle. We've all seen that. Classic, big, oppressive, dark, mysterious. There's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a labyrinthian inside. There's hidden rooms. There's uh, dimly lit halls. All the classic Gothic tradition that's sort of in Hogwarts Castle. Now, in 1959, a novel came out called The Haunting of Hill House uh, by Shirley Jackson. And there was a movie, a brilliant film made from that, called The Haunting in 1963. And that was sort of the time period when Gothic horror made its transition into what we now know as modern horror through the 60s and 70s. And I want to point out this, this novel and this movie specifically because it's, it's actually a brilliant uh, example of how to use setting as a character in your story. Has anyone seen the film The Haunting from 1963? Yeah. Um, this was the exterior of the building, which was actually a real place called Eddington Park in, uh, in England. It's a manor from the, from the 1550s. And he specifically chose it because it was haunted, or it was allegedly haunted. And as you can tell, even in the daylight when you see normal pictures of this place, it's just ominous and creepy. It's you know very big and impressive. But when you go inside, now the sets were built for the film, but he used some really interesting techniques to create this amazing setting, which became the character. I also use this, this technique in a film I directed called The Muse, which is that he has faces and things watching the characters throughout the film. And at times, even watching, he used wide-angle lenses throughout the film that were very unique at the time to give the house its own point of view, which was very unique and sort of the distorted viewpoint. Um, but you can see there was statues, there was art throughout the house that's constantly watching the protagonists, uh, even the door knockers. Even the textures of the wall, if you look here, you can see this face. Very creepy, that's actually a wonderful scene. And these sort of low angles that he used to create this oppressive feeling and claustrophobic feel of the, of the, of the house at times. Now, the book that's, that this movie is based on is written by Shirley Jackson, considered one of the great horror novels of all time. And uh, this is the opening, part of the opening paragraph, which has been reprinted many times. Uh, to me, it's one of the most perfect paragraphs ever written. I mean, it's brilliant. And this was also a shift in the prose from Gothic into modern horror, too. She was very economical in her, her usage of words, but she was very selective and careful with each specific word that you read this. She's talking about the house. Hill House, not sane. She's calling the house not sane. It's very interesting. It's this anthropomorphic usage of words to sort of describe the house as a, as a real thing. Uh, it stood by itself against its hills, holding darkness within. The house was holding darkness within. It has stood for 80 years and might stand 80 more. Within, walls continued upright. Bricks met neatly. Floors were firm and doors were sensibly shut. Silence lay steadily against the wooden stone of Hill House and whatever walked there walked alone. Descriptive of the house but also giving it sort of a personality, which I thought was very, very powerful. A couple more quick short ones here. The house was vile. She shivered in thought, the words coming freely into her mind. Hill House is vile. It is disease. Get away from here at once. Do you see what she's doing here? She's always talking about it as a person. Here's a couple quotes that lead me to the next subject, which is modern work. Mr. Klein was a fantastic writer. He was the, the original editor of Twilight Zone magazine. He said, before bringing the supernatural on stage, the writer must first establish so thoroughly that we can believe in it, the reality of the world. Author Moore Castle said, when the ordinary is invaded by a terrifying extraordinary, horror happens. And what they're saying there basically is that you have to make the reader believe, or the viewer believe in that reality. 
Also, what this does is when you when, you, when we brought Gothic when Gothic fiction sort of transitioned into modern horror, we took it out of the castles, we took it out of the graveyards, we took it out of the monasteries, and we brought it into people's apartments. We brought it into our into suburbia. Right, it became modern horror. But the challenge there is how do you make a sort of uh, a, a boring or uh, not not inherently scary environment scary? And that's what I got to talk about last year. Um, once you have them believing in your world, I believe there are four key ways that you can all look at, and, and again, feel free to write this down, that really tackle primal fears that, that, that go back to the beginning of man. Fear of the dark, claustrophobia, isolation, and fear of the unknown. And there are multiple ways to obviously scare your reader, but if you go back to those four core areas, I'm going to mention a few movies here that are very different types of horror, and yet they all sort of fall into these same categories of fears. The Shining. Everyone's seen The Shining, I assume, right? So, isolation, right? It's a winter storm, they're trapped in this hotel, um, and also uh, fear of the unknown, right? The room that Danny is about to go into. We don't know what's behind there. We know he's not supposed to go in, but it's terrifying because we don't know what's in there. Alien. Spaceship, again, isolation, there's claustrophobia, there's those dark tunnels that Captain Dallas is searching for the alien. We don't know what's behind the corner. We only see glimpses in fear of the dark. Those are all leveraged in alien. Rosemary's Baby, the film and the book. Isolation again, more metaphoric and physical, right? She's uh, abandoned by her husband. She's trapped in this apartment. Misery, everyone's seen Misery, read Misery, again, very different movie, and yet isolation was used very effectively as uh, a way to, you know, kind of creep the reader out and, and make you wonder what's going to happen next. The Thing, John Carpenter's The Thing, again, isolation, fear of the unknown, um, Night of the Living Dead, trapped in a farmhouse in the middle of nowhere. Isolation, right, claustrophobic, fear of the dark, fear of the unknown. Last couple, The Descent, if you've been seen that, wonderful setting, perfect, it's caves. What's not scary about caves? Again, claustrophobia, fear of the dark and those creatures that are in there, fear of the unknown. And lastly, Quarantine was a remake of the movie Wreck. Uh, very scary film, a lot of shaky cam. Again, claustrophobic, isolation, you're trapped in a building with these creatures, you don't know what's going on. So, that's my pitch. Uh, this we're talking about setting, so um, if you look at those four core primal fears as your baseline when you're trying to create, the, create a creepy environment and create a, cre a, create a creepy setting that's potentially its own character, if you kind of focus on those four things and build out from there, I guarantee you'll create a scary environment and a scary setting for your characters.